speeches. We have a very um, illustrious panel here, and we're very excited to hear from them. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the bios. Uh, they have extensive bios listed in the program, so I encourage you to look at the bios and get acquainted with um, much of the amazing work that they're all doing. Um, and we're going to begin with um, Pablo Mendez Lazaro, who's a professor in the Department of Environmental Health at the University of Puerto Rico. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, glad to be here. It's a pleasure for me to be part of this activity. I'm going to thank also the organizing committee for inviting me. Um, so I hit enter. OK, perfect. <laughs> I call this um, presentation Lessons from Puerto Rico in the Aftermath after Maria. But as you can notice, I didn't use the word learn. Because for me, we are still in a learning experience. We are still experiencing. We are in the learning curve. So in my very particular opinion, I think that in order to talk about lessons learned in Puerto Rico, we still need to overcome another hurricane <laughs> to see if we really learn something from Maria. Um, the other word that I use is roadmap to Macondo. I don't know how many of you are familiarized with uh, Latin American um, literature. But Macondo is this magical little town describing in the novel uh, Cien Años de Soledad, uh, written by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who won the Nobel Prize a few decades ago in literature. And he, he described this little town as a magic town where realism and, and fiction get mixed together. And it's a little bit like Puerto Rico. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I, I think that does not make us um, more particular or any unique in any manner. I think that all cities have a little bit of Macondo, and it could be considered also at the Neverland from, from Peter Pan, from the, from the British. But Macondo will be the Neverland for Latin American. <laughs> I will go directly to the point. Um, as you already know, on September 2017, Puerto Rico experienced one of the most catastrophic hurricane season in recent history. In the matter of two weeks, Hurricane Irma, Category 5, impacted um, the Lesser Antilles in the Caribbean, um, British Virgin Islands, U.S. Virgin Islands, and uh, St. Martin, St. Bart, uh, in the east part of the Caribbean. And it passed uh, 16 nautical miles northeast from Puerto Rico. And only two weeks after Hurricane Maria, a very powerful storm it was category five, we get impacted by Hurricane Maria. That it was, it arrived at Puerto Rico as a Hurricane category four. But we are still waiting for the official numbers from the National Hurricane Center. But in Puerto Rico, there are some rumors that people are talking that if the highest um, category for hurricanes are category five, we can consider Maria category 4.9 <laughs> because it was so much powerful that uh, it destroyed Puerto Rico. But after all, I want to give these presentations as different key messages uh, for you and to open the discussion after the roundtable. Um, after Maria, Puerto Rico experienced uh, disruptions in basic essential services. We lack uh, for uh, potable water. Almost 75% of the population lost uh, drinking water in the island. We lost total electric power, 100% of the population lack of electric power. 75% um, of the telecommunications went down as well. Transportations in terms of roads were blocked, bridges collapsed, seaports were closed for almost uh, a week and a half. And that's a lot to say for an island where all of the supplies and food come from the outside. A week and a half is a, is a long. <laughs> and, and, the, and the airports were closed as well almost for a week, complete week. Um, we were using only for FEMA and for the, for the uh, Army. <clears throat> the other aspect was uh, after Maria, we were suffering also for environmental health issues that compromised the, the, the well-being of the population. People started experiencing uh, problems with water sanitation because since with lack of uh, electric power, the, the water treatment plant wasn't working properly. So there were a lot of problems with water pollution and the drinking water. So we started to drink um, bottled water. That, after all, it became a problem for the debris as practice. Um, 
We were exposed to a lot of different contaminants as well from the debris. We have a lot of problems with vector-borne diseases, problem with food hygiene due to the lack of electricity. Um, some of the population get poisoned through carbon monoxide by the malfunction of the portable uh, electric generators, and they were using it inside of their residential units, so you can imagine. <laughs> um, and a lot of exposure to mold due to the humidity and the lack of ventilation that is occurred. <clears throat> uh, I would like to highlight that Maria didn't destroy Puerto Rico. Maria was just like a ticking bomb um, announcing that he was uh, arriving to an island that it was already dire, in a very dire situation, long before Maria. Um, as an example, I don't know how many of you are aware, but Puerto Rico declared bankruptcy in 2017. But in 2017, it was when the government recognized that it was impossible to pay the debt that we have. But we were having confronting economical problems since more than a decade. And I think that Carlos maybe had more information about that than, than I do. <clears throat> As a gift from the US Congress, <laughs> they declared PROMESA. And PROMESA um, assigned us uh, a financial oversight and management board that now it had total control of the budget that are allocated to Puerto Rico. And they made the decision where or oh, how do we use that money. <clears throat> As another aspect, um, since we are in bankruptcy, we have expensive and obsolete infrastructure that's already fulfilled in life, life, life cycle. That could be for water, for example. We have uh, our reservoirs lost almost 50% of their capacity to storage water in Puerto Rico, and that's a huge problem because we suffered a, a, a very uh, dr important drought in 2014 and 2016. <clears throat> um, in terms of the part of demography and the, the quality of life in the island, we have the highest rate of unemployment in all the US comparing with the mainland or, or the continental US. And we have the highest rate of population living below poverty level as well. So those things are social determinants that are um, very important factors before just analyzing the climate hazard as Maria. <clears throat> We have also hundreds of thousand people living um, exposed to flood prone areas, to coastal flood areas, river floods, urban floods, landslide. And we have also a lot of uh, conditions, pre existing conditions, that require more special equipment and assistance. I could be Puerto Rico ranks the first in terms of diabetes prevalence among all the United States. Puerto Rico ranked the first in terms of asthma and respiratory diseases, and when it goes to pediatricians and to kids, it's almost 60% of children that have asthma in Puerto Rico. We rank the fifth in adult obesity, and we have an elderly population, senior citizens, that if you analyze the literature, senior citizens are the most important age group after disasters, as it happened in Katrina, as it happened in Japan with the tsunami, and it happens as well in Puerto Rico. But beyond, to, beyond looking at all these profiles and the characteristics of the population, I think that, well, I believe that we need to pay attention to those interactions that, um, that are part of our components, very important in the aspect of the, of the system, and how the individuals interact with their communities, and how their communities interact with the environment, not only built environment, but the natural environment, biodiversity, and how do we adapt to the, the, the climate aspect. So not only to take on the consideration the social determinant of health, as I, they are called by the World or Health Organization, those are the, the conditions in which the people are born, their growth, they live, they work, they age, and they die. But I think that the interactions between all of those components are the most important things. I bring these two graphics, and I'm sure that most of you are very familiarized with it, is that they are trying to simplify the concept of resilience. To the left side, we have the, the, the resilience that is uh, conceptualized 
or attribute to the, to the infrastructure. And to the right side, we have the one that is related to ecological resilience or ecosystem services. As we can see, the most amazing thing is that both of them receive the same disrupted event as could be Maria. But what is amazing is how infrastructure, the curve in infrastructure almost collapsed at a 90 degree angle while the ecological um, aspect and the ecosystem performance, as you can see, the curve is, is smoother than the one uh, to the left. And I show you this because, as it had been said in theory, it's happened in reality in Puerto Rico. While we were struggling to survive in Puerto Rico, trying to get in water, to get food, um, to, to, to get things uh, uh, running over the island, there were some people that were analyzing data. <laughs> There's two parallel worlds. Um, but thanks to that, we have this kind of information. To the left side, we have the NSAT Vegetation Index that it was analyzed um, weeks ago after Hurricane Maria. And to the right side, we can see how the energy system in Puerto Rico definitely collapsed right uh, 24 hours after Maria. As you can see, also, the ecological system recovered pretty quickly as opposed to the infrastructure to the right side that we are still struggling to put it back together. So my message is that all system collapse in Puerto Rico, communication system, transportation, electricity, except the ecosystem. The ecosystem was the only one that it kept functioning and it continued to supply the, the services that are supplied by ecosystem. I'm just showing you a few pictures here. So you can have an, an idea of what happened in Puerto Rico in terms of infrastructure. So Puerto Rico complies with the, um, one of the principles of resiliency to have the interconnected infrastructure. Perfect, that's really nice. But without redundancy and without diversity, that's one of the main principles of resilience. Um, um, interconnectivity making nothing is the opposite. It's a cascading effect that after what, what you will see is that all system will collapse. The other key message is that um, Puerto Rico failed in terms of land use and planning. And this is something very important. I strongly believe, and please don't get me wrong, that no matter where you live, you will need to have at least basic essential services. You will need to have access to water, clean water, electricity, education, and health. Okay, but there's uh, things that you cannot live in the middle of the ocean and, and wait for the government to give you or to supply all the infrastructure. So the lack of enforcement, what makes these people more vulnerable because the government allows them to live in places, very remote areas and places that nowadays are totally unsustainable where to live. As you can imagine, we were allowing the population to live in those conditions. So this is something to take under consideration. And I will be very quickly to show you pictures on how the lack of land use planning exposed our population to risk prone areas. And after all, it's very difficult in order to respond or to get to them after a disaster. In a Maria, it happens also, it's occurred in a context of climate change. I'm not saying that hurricanes are more frequently impacting Puerto Rico or are occurring with more intense or anything, but we cannot uh, forget that, for example, in the last six years, Puerto Rico have received at least one of these extreme events. And I heard a few minutes ago that there is someone there that don't like the word extreme, but <laughs> if, we, if we use it in a term that extreme, can, extreme event can you know, define as a, those events that are capable of treating operational continuity in our society, pushing our response capacity to the limit, I believe that, yes, we can use extreme events. In 2014, 2016, we suffered a, a huge drought in Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rico was declared disaster in 2015, 2016, and this is the third consecutive year when Puerto Rico is declared a disaster zone. Once, 2015, 2016, due to, a, to the drought, and 2017, due to the, to the Hurricane Maria. But we have evidence that all of them have happening in Puerto Rico. In 2012, it was the first time that Puerto Rico record a heat prolonged episode. And for the first time in Puerto Rico, believe it or not, 
there was uh, an associated with heat mortality in Puerto Rico and not accidental mortality. The, the, the mortality increases three times for uh, elderly and population with cardio, cardiovascular diseases. And as time was showing also in this morning, there is a corridor of population that could be considered more vulnerable to this kind of hazard. So um, the, the manuscript is available on the internet. You can have more information there, and you will see how the index was, was built. But obviously, it will take under, it's taking under consideration the social determinants of health, L people that live below poverty levels, people that doesn't have um, highest degrees or diplomas or educational level, people that doesn't have private insurance companies. Um, in 2014, as I mentioned, Puerto Rico suffered a drought. We were declared a disaster zone 2015 and 2016, and this is evidence of what we had there. And in 2017, we get the impact of Hurricane Maria. But then, in 2018, in March 2018, we suffered the impact of one of the biggest coastal floods in Puerto Rico in March 5th, 2018, a winter storm get into the Caribbean, and we, we receive wave 30 feet bigger, or bigger, sorry. Um, so the waves were bigger in the winter storm that we received in March 2018 than the waves that were created by the hurricane. So that was another important issue. And for future consideration, um, I, I would like to say that we have dysfunctional governments in both sides of the, <laughs> of the coast at the federal uh, level, and we have at the municipal level, and we have it also at the state level. All government are dysfunctional. Um, Hurricane Maria didn't destroy Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico was destroyed decades ago. We are and we were in a dire situation, and I think that what Maria just done in Puerto Rico was to reveal to the world, to the rest, of, for some Puerto Rican as well, that we were living in misery. Um, due to those aspects of crisis in Puerto Rico and climate hazards, we are losing young professionals. And that means that we are losing taxpayers, we are losing new ideas, and we are losing our future generation. And I think that the guys from the journalists um, are, have that data very clear, that we are losing also kids. And that's very important to keep and maintain a country with new ideas. So what is worth that I think that we are doing business as usual, and I want to present you uh, a picture um, of that uh, because FEMA is very proud of their job and the Corps of Engineers as well, as well as the government of Puerto Rico. And someone tell them, be careful, because the data that they are showing doesn't mean that it's accurate or uh, it's not the most important thing. But to the left side, you will see a new release that it came out on April 25th, 2018, where FEMA was very proud of environmental compliance, improving post disaster restoration in Puerto Rico. But when you see the picture to the right side, they are allowing to install new poles, electricity poles, right in front of the beach, where we receive more than nine feet of coastal flood, and all of the electricity there, well, fell down. So we are, we are rebuilding Puerto Rico uh, we are bouncing back, yeah, but we are not bouncing back better as it's uh, supposed to do with resilience. We are doing business as usual. And I know it's very difficult to, re to think in the recovery and to think also in resilience because you want to, to, to recover as quickly as possible. But I think that the, 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 the idea of, of, of rebuilding the way the things were before they're gonna be destroyed in the near, in the future hurricane season that's gonna start in a few weeks. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. And next we will have Carlos Vargas Ramos from the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College. First of all, I'd like to thank the Zolberg Center, um, uh, Solberg Institute for um, Migration and Mobility for the invitation to this conference, and uh, its director, Professor uh, Alenikov, and also you know, Casey, thank you. Amanda, thank you for helping us in the logistics of this conference. Uh, a lot of what I, um, Pablo, have just discussed is uh, complementary to what I will have to say. I will therefore you know, move very quickly uh, so we can also uh, engage and entertain a number of questions that you may have. Um, 
title of the presentation, Puerto Rico, Post Maria, and, and its effects on the migration to the United States, because, as Paolo just pointed out, uh, one of the effects of the uh, hurricane has been to exacerbate the emigration from the island. And, and uh, Paolo just hinted at a brain drain uh, from, from Puerto Rico as a result of the hurricane. I say that it's not just a brain drain. It's a brain drain and a gut drain and a lung drain and a spleen drain. People are leaving the island from all socioeconomic classes, educational levels, and age groups, although overrepresented among the productive age groups uh, who are also uh, uh, the reproductive age groups uh, on the island. And uh, I'll speak to some of those implications very briefly. On September 20th, 2017, Maria struck as a Category 4 storm with sustained winds blowing at 145 miles per hour, per hour peaking at 155 miles per hour as it made landfall. The northwest trajectory of the storm assured that the entire island would be affected. These are storms that when they follow those paths, they cause the most destruction, certainly in Puerto Rico. Uh, the devastation created by the cyclone has been the worst since Hurricanes San Felipe struck the island in 1928 and the equivalent uh, to Hurricane San Ciprian, which hit the island in 1932. Just as then, uh, Hurricanes Maria and Irma hit Puerto Rico as the island was in the midst of a devastating economic crisis. Hurricane Maria caused officially 64 deaths, although press accounts place the number at well above 1,000. Economically, it has been estimated that the hurricanes collectively caused $90 billion in damages to the infrastructure and property of the country. The winds and rain knocked down electric power generation, the electricity delivery grid, and roadways and bridges throughout the island. Moreover, the supply of drinking water was affected because water pumping stations operate on the same supply of electricity as the rest of the country. The wind and rain further destroyed or damaged about 100,000 homes, displacing tens of thousands of uh, people into homelessness. Uh, and this is a list of the, the hurricanes that have uh, hit Puerto Rico uh, through the, you know, since the 1899, and the ones that are highlighted in red are the ones that have been the most catastrophic uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, they show the strength of the storm, or the estimated strength of the storm as they hit the island, and the cost uh, in damages, physical damages as a result, based on the numbers at that time. Um, one difference between those two periods, the 1930s and the present, uh, uh, when hurricanes San Felipe and San Cyprian struck, uh, and presently is that the island then, in the 1930s, was just entering the economic crisis that represented the Great Depression worldwide, unlike the case of Puerto Rico at the time Irma and Maria hit, when Puerto Rico was already a decade into what can be characterized as another economic depression. Moreover, the administrations of the federal government that responded to those natural disasters uh, responded very differently in the 20th century as they did in the 21st century. Puerto Rico benefited then from a political economy that favored direct intervention of the government in the economy, whereas at present, the winds have shifted away from governmental intervention to the minimum necessary, and it is retreating further from such intervention. Furthermore, unlike the Puerto Rico of the 20th century, particularly at the time those horrific cyclones hit the island, its population was growing in the 1930s. Puerto Rico's population presently not only is dwindling, but in fact is entering into a demographic winter. None of this bodes well for Puerto Ricans. The situation is indeed dire uh, without any hint of exaggeration. Uh, to understand the extent of the impact of the hurricanes on Puerto Rico, and its people, I would like to spend a little bit of time outlining the context in which the cyclones hit, and, 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 and Pablo has suggested some of, the, some of these items, uh, just to understand how they have magnified the economic crisis exponentially. As I mentioned, when the hurricane hit Puerto Rico, had been in an economic decline since 2006, uh, and that is the peak of the curve in this, uh, in this chart, 
which is produced by the Government Development Bank, uh, indicating the index of economic activity, which correlates very well with the gross domestic product of Puerto Rico. So the economic crisis in Puerto Rico, beginning in 2006, preceded, uh, took place two years before uh, the economic decline that is known now as the Great Recession hit the United States and the rest of the world economy. The trigger for that economic crisis in Puerto Rico uh, was a downturn of the business cycle uh, coupled with the complete phase-out of a tax incentive the U.S. government had granted companies that established shop in Puerto Rico. Under Section 936 of the Internal Revenue Code, companies doing business in Puerto Rico were exempt from federal taxes on the income they earned in Puerto Rico. However, in 1995, the U.S. Congress uh, eliminated those uh, incentives, phasing them out over a 10-year period, which culminated in 2006, actually the end of 2005. Consequently, companies benefiting from those federal tax exemptions began reducing its workforce in Puerto Rico or ceasing operations altogether, with a concomitant increase in unemployment. In order uh, to address the result resulting economic crisis and to close the structural budget deficit that a reduction in economic activity created, successive administrations of the Commonwealth government began to borrow money. Never a good thing when you're trying to close a structural deficit. Uh, the ability to borrow money in bond markets in the United States come from, came from Puerto Rico's ability to issue bonds that were exempt from taxes at the federal, state, slash Commonwealth, and local levels making them very attractive to large as well as small investors. This triple tax exemption was established by the same Jones Act that made U.S. citizens out of Puerto Ricans in 1917. Moreover, the bonds issued by the Commonwealth government were attractive to investors because they were backed by the full faith and credit of the Commonwealth government as it is, as it is established in its Commonwealth Constitution. This means that in case of an economic crunch, such as the one the government is experiencing right now, those bonds were to be paid ahead of any other obligation the government uh, of Puerto Rico had. Because of the depth and length of the economic crisis that started in 2006, by 2016, uh, different governmental entities um, of Puerto Rico, including the Commonwealth government, the municipal governments and public corporations that provided, among other things, public utilities, had collectively accumulated $72 billion in debt and another $40 billion in government obligations to pension funds and others. By 2014, the government of Puerto Rico was unable to make any payments on its debt obligations. It was insolvent. However, the government was unable to declare bankruptcy in the U.S. federal court because in 1984, the U.S. Congress removed the ability of, for Puerto Rico to do so. In light of a disorderly default of the government obligations and its inability to establish a locally crafted bankruptcy process, the U.S. Congress passed in 2016 the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, PROMESA, which among other things, allowed for a process parallel to federal bankruptcy over the, under the oversight of a U.S. federal judge. It also created the Financial Oversight and Management Board, known in Puerto Rico as La Junta. The passing of PROMESA allowed a stay in debt payment until the government of Puerto Rico reorganized its finances uh, under the, uh, the oversight of La Junta. So Hurricanes Maria and Irma have only come to exacerbate and magnify exponentially the economic and humanitarian crisis uh, the people of Puerto Rico were already experiencing as a result of the economic crisis. One of the most visible impacts of the economic crisis in Puerto Rico prior to the hurricanes in 2017 has been that of the massive migration of Puerto Ricans from the island to the United States, something that the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, uh, for which I work, has been documenting ever since. Um, this graph shows the extent to which the Puerto Rican population uh, uh, in the orange line, uh, now surpasses the Puerto Rican population in Puerto Rico. So there are more Puerto Ricans living in the United States than they lived in Puerto Rico. And that happened uh, sometime around 2005, 2006 or so. Okay. Uh, the gray line also indicates the number of Puerto Ricans that have continued to migrate to the United States. Um, and here we see 
uh, the same trend, how the Puerto Rican population in the red uh, continues to decline, well, uh, whereas the Puerto Rican population in the U.S. continues to increase right about the time of the economic crisis. Not that they were necessarily correlated, uh, however, uh, th th it is coincidental that they took place at the same time. Um, this chart indicates the level of migration and return migration to Puerto Rico. The top line, the black line, indicates the level of migration to the United States or emigration from Puerto Rico. The red line indicates the level of return migration from the United States to Puerto Rico. And as we can see is that from the beginning of the economic crisis in Puerto Rico in 2006, uh, you had somewhere between 50,000 people uh, uh, through uh, the end of the economic crisis in the United States. Beginning in 2011, the number of Puerto Ricans living the island continued to increase until by 2016, on average, there were about 70,000 people living the island every year, every year. You still had a return migration to the island uh, that uh, um, contracted a little bit um, when there was an economic crisis in Puerto Rico, uh, and rather there was also an economic crisis in the United States. When there's an economic crisis in the United States, sometimes people go back to the island because they can find some resources to, to live there. But then comes 2017, and you see the, the area in yellow. These are estimates that we at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies have uh, made uh, on the basis of the previous projections from the previous year. So if in 2015, 2016, there were about 70,000 people uh, living the island every year, we were estimating that in the three years following the hurricane, so between 2017 and 2020, we are estimating that about over 400,000 people uh, will have left the island. Uh, I will very briefly point to um, this point right here to indicate that in fact, since the hurricane started, until about February of 2018, 135,000 people have left the island. So if in a period of 10 years, between 2006 and 2016, half a million people have left the island, we estimate that that same number of people will probably leave the island over the next three years. Um, my time is up, I just wanted to show you, we have gotten the, the, the data for um, those estimates from FEMA, as well as the count for students that have registered in the United States, in six elected states in the United States. And based on those projections, we estimate that 135,000 people uh, have left the island. Uh, I was ready to present some polit political implications of this migration from Puerto Rico, but I will leave that for the Q&A later on. Thank you, Carlos. Um, and next up is Walter Meyer, who is, uh, Professor Parsons here, um, and also the co-founder of the local office landscape and urban design firm. Thank you. All right, um, let's be a little more optimism. It's uh, unfortunate that we're living in this new global condition with this regional uh, misfortune. Um, but there are stories post Maria that I want to share with you uh, that are important metrics. These are projects that. Uh, our firm designed and built starting back in 2006 that are projects at the scale of a city that uh, were pressure tested by two tropical storm events and now a category five wind event. The first project um, was one of the projects that founded our firm back in 2006. Um, this was a commission, the client was uh, the governor of Puerto Rico, the mayor of Mayaguez on the west coast, it's the third largest city and the capital of the west side of the island um, that we informally call, or informally call the Republic of Western Puerto Rico. Um, and then uh, the Central American Games Committee. Um, so this project, if you look on the upper right corner, there's a pipe on the beach, and there were several of these conditions. And the budget for two kilometers of coast in a very urban condition with a post-industrial landscape of concrete and burned out cars, uh, this was not a place you went to but that $55 million budget was not enough to address this from a conventional hard infrastructure perspective. So we worked with the Departamento de Recursos Naturales to create a pilot within what would be defined as a Title IV wetland area to transfer uh, metrics from EPA, 
uh, for performance under green infrastructure and coastal resiliency guidelines. So that we had a budget for, which is simply saying to use nature to polish water and protect the city from the sea, and inversely to protect the sea from pollution. Um, this approach is in our office what we call forensic ecology, um, where we project through conjectural mapping what the city was like before human inter uh, interaction, so the pre-settled condition. And this is not a study of nostalgia, we're not bringing back nature in that way, but harvesting uh, how this, the systems interacted then between fresh and salt water and all the other layers of the environment. Then we ground truth that conjectural mapping with uh, analog ecosystems that are intact still adjacent to the site. And that's the image at the bottom right. And it's important to note there's lessons from that history, um, that deep history. Um, and that river you see approaching the ocean in the bottom right, uh, it doesn't touch the ocean. It has a, a dune system that separates the ocean from the river. So all the pollutants in that river get polished through the roots of that forest on the edge and finally polished to the sand dune. Only when there's a heavy rain for a few hours does that sand dune open up and then after the rain stops, that sand dune with a few hours will close back up. The forces that close a sand dune within an hour or two is littoral drift and the trade winds, which all come from the same direction. And that important lesson is where we wanna figure out how to reshape the city to allow that adaptive valve, nature's check valve, if you will, to exist within the urban environment. Um, it's a multi-dimensional problem. We have groundwater, salt water, fresh water. This is an elevated groundwater area um, that we're designing within. So we have to understand all the forces at work, including groundwater liquefaction. It's all in sand. Um, and also leveraging um, what the, you know, the deep history of the site was from a rhizome perspective, looking at how the roots held dunes together and what that system needs to stay intact and then able to shrink that system to fit in the urban environment, um, kind of like a music instrument, right? Then adding within that dune system a water treatment functionality. So, uh, you know, this is a cross section from city to sea. Um, there are new parcels and uh, a tax increment finance district that helps pay for the park over time, a new boulevard. All these parcels and boulevards pitch back to the wetlands so that when the civil infrastructure, that is the underground pipes fail, the uh, surface water creates a, a second layer of backup uh, drainage um, called surface conveyance in engineering terms. Um, but from a design perspective, we essentially have a wastewater treatment system below ground. So primary treatment in a gravel bed, secondary treatment through phytoremediation, that's bacteria that live in the roots of the plants that pull out nitrogen and phosphorus, and then uh, all the fines are polished in the base of the sand dune. So that sand dune is dub doubling as protecting against tsunamis and hurricanes, uh, but the base of the sand dune is that polishing system. Because the project was so large, we adapted to all the existing context behind it. So you see a school across the street that was a junior high school. Uh, this was overflow parking lot for the Central American Games for one month, but we wanted to design the second life of this parking lot into the project so there wasn't a maintenance burden on the city of Mayaguez after the games leave. And notice the size of these are for um, you know, a farmer's market and be able to till the land for growing, um, and these brick areas uh, can have tents uh, for market. As the park moves from a junior high school to an, uh, a nursery school, we create a playground in the same proportion system in this kit of parts of program that can change over time. And even though the project could not afford uh, solar panels at the time, we scaled and pre-wired all the shade trellises to slide in with a future grant uh, solar panels, which would be hurricane proof, and we designed and wind modeled for that. Um, this is a photograph of that same pipe. So remember that pipe on the beach? That pipe is now trimmed back to where the uh, city ends, and that's that pipe on the right. So see that opening? So that opening, uh, there's a lot of solids that come out of that, like bottles and things like that. And they all um, are screened by this salt grass and this black mangrove. And a, their standard vacuum truck drives up you know, through, we designed a multi-use path 
so they can vacuum out those solids once a week. And then there's a series of systems of uh, oysters, uh, as well as um, mosquito larvae eating minnows, and this system also um, uh, has beneficial bacteria that are um, baked into it to eat the skin of mosquito larvae. People are really worried about Zika in the Caribbean, and when you design for water systems, you have to embed biological management into it. This is post Maria, um, and it's important to note that there's only secondary impacts on the project, and these are the metrics of imperfection. The project didn't operate 100% resilient, but we lost 91% of the coastal forest, 9% uh, of the coastal forest, so it was 91% intact. We had massive waves, uh, six-foot surge, but interviewing the businesses behind this, um, they said that the, sur the, the urban flotsam of docks and boats and broken things stayed within the coastal forests. Um, that the surge itself stayed within the park, so it performed as design, and they had the heaviest rains ever measured, two feet in a day, and they said all the water drained back to the wetland, and their buildings behind this business, behind this park, were able to open the next business day after Maria, and the businesses at the edge of the park, there's a marina back there, are still rebuilding, and Army Corps is still rebuilding that shore, so there's a Inter interrelationship between green infrastructure and uh, business continuity and insurance. There's a lot of misinformation post Maria that solar panels and hurricanes don't mix. It's not true. If you specify a solar panel in the standard way, any bit of wind will blow it away. It's just a design challenge. So we designed a half megawatt solar array, 10 stories in the air in San Juan several years ago. We modeled for uh, pressure at the neighborhood scale as well as the building scale and re create uh, pressure relief apertures that fit the existing lines of force within the existing architecture. So there's a retrofit, and this is part of three blocks in downtown San Juan and San Thursday. This is called Ciudadela. And you can go up there today, and this project um, only lost 2% of its solar panels to shearing, and you can see them here, and another 6% to projectiles. The re compare that to other systems which lost 33% of the systems island-wide. The, the, we did a post-mortem. If we had switched from a quarter-inch bolt to a 3 8 inch stainless bolt, uh, it would have eliminated that 2% shearing. And if we had laid the system even flatter, we would have had less projectile impact. These numbers are important. and th These are raw data, but we just had an advisement session with FEMA and Department of Homeland Security in the field as they're shifting from uh, emergency budgeting to recovery, which allows resiliency to happen. And a lot of that advisement sessions extended from our advisement to the White House, where Jennifer and I, post Sandy, were part of the Sandy Task Force, advising on um, you know, shovel ready projects, part of the $60 billion contract for New York and New Jersey, and advising on uh, white papers from the White House on finding parity between natural infrastructure and hard infrastructure in economic terms. So it's easy for Army Corps to do their job. Right after, uh, weeks after, excuse me, a few um, days after the storm, I heard from my father on the northwest coast of Puerto Rico in Isabella that things were bad for him and on the block. And when I got there, I realized the whole island is really bad. We, we are one of the, I, I organized a team of 10 solar technicians from the mainland. Uh, and to come down and assess. Uh, we were the first uh, civilian flight to land. Um, we've organized with the design community here in New York, um, and I reached out to vendors that I specify for large microgrid projects in the mainland uh, who normally salivate when I call with million dollar contracts. This time I called with a favor. Um, I said, send me whatever grade B material you can't sell. I will write a 501c3 letter for the value of it. Um, and we have 767 cargo jets lined up with uh, Governor Cuomo uh, and Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez. And we've been flying three large cargo jets in since the storm. Uh, we turned our studio, as you see here, into a after hours shadow government for Puerto Rico, uh, landing on the west side of the island where we don't have to deal with the governor or FEMA. We had full control of the airfield. While we were putting up solar panels, Whitefish was putting up the grid. And one of my installers sent this photo um, in the mountains in Utuado, and he said, they're just trying to get the power on, and they're patching, and we're building a new future. 
we uh, collaborated with University of Puerto Rico Mayaguez with Turabo University and Interamericana University on sending us college students who couldn't go to class. They want to help. We had materials. We had experts. This is the, the guy on the left is a NABCEP certified solar technician teaching Alejandro on the right how to do solar. They learn within a week. They get NABCEP certified, and we teach them to teach others. This is the emergency room in Isabella Hospital with a solar system paid for by the artist Carol Walker. Ai Weiwei reached out. He said, love what you're doing. I want to come and help. I'm doing uh, migration work. And so he came for three days and, and helped us. And the arts community has been incredible. We've had um, Lin-Manuel Miranda sponsored a few cargo jets, uh, as well as uh, Justin Bryce Guarlia, one of the artists embedded in NASA, making literary sense of big data. Um, one of my favorite artists. If you don't know his work, check him out. Um, and I'll, leave, I'll close with this video of, um, of the 41 sites. This one for me was, uh, as I was installing them, in tears because the level of neglect. We found an orphanage in Adjuntas in the center mountain range where no one had been, uh, and they were grateful. We energized it right before Christmas, so here's a little video. Hopefully it plays. Nueve, ocho, siete, seis, cinco, cuatro, Thank you. Thank you, Walter. And um, next we'll have Catalina Jaramillo, from, is an environmental reporter um, at WHYY's uh, Plan Philly. So she's going to talk to us a little bit about her work. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm a reporter. I'm not an expert. Um, I've been covering the people coming from Puerto Rico to Philadelphia since October. I work for WHYY, which is the public radio station there. Um, I switch between two projects, Plan Philly, where it's more, mostly like urban development, um, website and state impact, which is a little bit more science and economic. But I cover environment in both. So I'm going to try to like give you a little bit of a picture of what's the challenge of a city that has been receiving evacuees. Um, I'm going to speak about Philadelphia because that's what I know. But these have been like similar in different cities here in the US. We have a big Puerto Rican population. Um, it's the fifth largest in the country. 75% of our Latino population is really is from Puerto Rico. And we also have a big population of Puerto Ricans in Camden, which is, I don't know if you know Philly, but it's just basically like, if we're talking about Williamsburg here, it's like just across the bridge from Philly. Um, so I'm gonna also show some quotes because I'm a radio reporter, so I believe in the power of like audio. Um, a little bit of what happened, like so in the beginning, um, in October, the Philadelphia Office of Emergency Management opened a disaster center, um, and only after nine days, 233 people have already gone there. Um, this is like people who knew that this was opening. Um, this is people, mostly people that need help because they wanted some kind of services. So. This is not a number that is totally representative of how many people were there. Um, but it's still a lot of people for nine days. And then like in November, so like a little bit after that, November 6th, the number went up to 739 people, 661 families. So they actually moved to a larger office. Like the office was too small. I started reporting at that time. Um, the situation was pretty chaotic. The city didn't know much what to do. Um, the, like, yeah, the, the emergency management was kind of like taking charge and responsibility for organizing all the other city agencies and putting, and, and in that office people could find uh, help 
related to health, to housing, um, to schools, to food, um, all the needs. Uh, most, most, a lot of the people who are coming had medical issues, they had no jobs, um, they had nowhere to stay, and they didn't speak English. So everything was a challenge. Uh, most of the people was also, also traumatized. The people that, the families I was talking there were very traumatized with, with, with what just happened to them. Um, some of them were staying with families and friends, but a lot of them were by, them, by themselves. Um, so everything was very confusing. Um, I'm gonna play this clip. Um, Council man, ma, Councilwoman Maria Quinones Sanchez, uh, she represents the North, North Philadelphia district where there's uh, most of the uh, Puerto Rican population lives there. Um, she's herself, she's Puerto Rican. Um, and she was saying she was receiving, uh, I don't know, like 10 calls every day from people coming uh, to Philadelphia asking her for help. So I would venture to guess that every, about half of every daily flight from American Airlines is coming with people who are coming here to stay temporarily or are really seeking um, some sort of refuge until the things in Puerto Rico normalize whatever the new normal is going to be there. So that was the situation like in October, November. Like the city was seeing that all these people are coming. Maria is also very active in uh, affordable housing issues. Affordable housing in, 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 in Philadelphia is a big issue. We don't have capacity. People are waiting for years. Um, so this was like all of a sudden, in less than a month, you have 361 families that need house. Um, then in November, in one of the meetings, uh, the director of the Office of Emergency Management tells the community, this is the, the, the Puerto Rican community and NGOs and organizations, it's a big community in Philly, so they were having uh, meetings like with more people than the people that are here now every once a week. It's kind of like say like, what do we do? Who does what? You know, like where do we take money for these people? Who can host these people? Who can give us food? Um, and in that meeting, he announced this famous TSA program, with this, which is the Temporary um, Sheltering Assistance Program from FEMA, which is basically giving hotel vouchers for people to stay temporarily in hotels. At that time, we didn't know for how long. We were talking about 30 days, maybe, 60 days. Um, and everything was so, like, the city was so not prepared for something like this, that um, TSA works uh, in a way that FEMA gives these vouchers for hotels that are registered in the city uh, to be part of this program with FEMA. There was no hotel registered in Philadelphia to be part of this program. So part of the work of the Office of Emergency Management was like go to hotels and say like, please register in this list of FEMA, then wait for FEMA to accept them and then finally trying to move some families to hotels. And then also there was no federal funds coming in. I mean, most of the times the city has to respond to an emergency that is happening in the city or in the territory and that immediately unlocks funds. Um, but in this situation, there was no extra funds to have um, the city. We, like, the, there was, it's also this political kind of like um, uh, environment that they like, you, like the city officials were like, well, the federal government is not doing anything, so we're gonna have to respond, but we don't have funds, so what do we do? So then I would say like we went through like a, a, a period of more like adaptation, you know, like this is what's going on. I was speaking at, some time, at that time with some <coughs> experts, um, and I spoke first with uh, Jeff DeValco from Ohio University. And she, uh, he was saying how like, sorry, <coughs> climate change is forcing local governments to fundamentally shift the way with, uh, they think about emergency response because um, as I said, like cities are used to responding to things happening in their, in their territory, but this for the first time, like 
they have also to respond to uh, disasters happening outside their territory. And because when that happens, people are going to move, and they're going to move where they have families or friends. So if they have community there, um, they're going to move there. And that makes, I mean, at the same time, that's like a, a double um, thing because like the, 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 the families who do, do, do have friends and do have communities in, the, in other places are at the same time more resilient because they have more resources. <clears throat> so I'm going to try to play that clip. It is not that climate change caused them to move because climate change doesn't cause a single storm, but it can't make them more intense. And so the impacts of those storms are more severe, causing more people to move. So the idea that climate change is going to cause more migration, that we've heard that um, it's not necessarily that climate change causes the migration, but it makes it more, it pushes. <coughs> then Bra uh, Dan Bradley's the director of the uh, Philadelphia Office of Emergency Management. And when I was interviewing him, he also was saying this thing of like how unusual the situation was for him and for his office. It is not that climate change... Nope. You know, it does raise some questions because this is happening outside of the normal disaster process uh, where really our mission is for Philadelphia to respond to emergencies here. Um, we're perhaps blazing a new trail. So offices of emergency management in different cities are faced with this new situation, right? Like now they have to respond to a disaster that is not happening there. And those systems are not there now. Um, and then finally I spoke with uh, Billy Fleming from the University of Pennsylvania. He's more from the urban planning side. Um, and he was also saying how cities are going to have to prepare for this and how, like, city planning has to start consider considering these situations as a reality now, not, not anymore like, a, like something we're seeing in books or something like that. What he's saying, and, 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 um, which is the number one crisis in most of cities is housing. Like, there's a need of housing. There's no places to put these people. Like, even in Philadelphia, where we have, like, a boom of construction, um, there's no places to put people. So, uh, so how, do we, how, do, how do cities plan to have this kind of, like, vacant property? Or how do we have the flexibility of, like, upzoning, maybe? Or, like, how, how, can, like, how can planners foresee or prepare for these situations where suddenly you have an influx of 900 families in your, in your city? How do you, ha where do you take those 900 homes for these families? Um, and then came a moment of like f f going from short term to long term kind of like reality from crisis to recovery, right? Um, the whole situation of the whole state, like you know how like FEMA has to declare your state as whole state to get uh, federal funds and there was in all this, like only Florida has had that designation, but media was saying that New York had it and Jersey had it, that was not right. Um, and there was this whole debate also, like, which also shows a little bit of like improvisation that was happening. It's like, so this is a decision made by governor, but the governor of Puerto Rico have to kind of like agree with the governor of your state to ask FEMA to get this, um, this whole situation and then I was interviewing uh, the, the governor of Puerto Rico that went to Philadelphia and said, no, I already asked for this and I'd send the letter. And then I would call the, the governor, governor, Tom Wolf from Pennsylvania. He, he was saying like, no, we already have that. We already asked it. And it, the governor of Puerto Rico has to ask it. And then you call FEMA and FEMA was like, no, the governor, like everyone was like throwing the ball at each other. So it's like, okay. Um, TSA program had, as I, I was telling you, like this kind of like deadlines. And the first deadline was uh, very not <laughs> adequate because it was uh, some Valentine's Day. So on some Valentine's, like all these people had to go to the street in the middle of the winter in February. Um, it was extended to April 20th. Then uh, April 20th was just extended to May 14th. And now the governor is asking for June. 
But this is people that are still, in, like, it, this is people who are staying in hotels, families who are staying in hotels, they don't have jobs. They need to, to rent a place, they need to have savings to pay first, last, and security, right? They don't have jobs. They don't know English. Um, if they find jobs, they have to save. Uh, so it's like, it's a, it's, a, it's a slow process. And in the meanwhile, the city and the, and the, um, the city emergency uh, center, for example, that opened in Philadelphia closed in December. Uh, in, 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 in New York, the, also the disaster center in, in Julia Burgos uh, closed, I think, in January. So kind of like the, 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 the short term recovery help kind of like ended, and then these people were still kind of like a la deriva, not knowing what to do. Um, and in Philadelphia, at least this special thing happened where like all these organizations created um, a group that is called the Greater Philadelphia Long-Term Recovery Committee, which is a group of 40 organizations and city agencies. It's part of a national board. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a voluntary organization of disasters uh, response. Um, I spoke with an academic that told me that this was the first time that one of these cha chapters opened in a city for evacuees, like the first time that we're having to create this institution for some disaster that didn't happen in the area, but a disaster that happened outside. Um, and New Jersey also created like a commission of Puerto Rico, uh, of, uh, a commission of relief. Um, so what I'm trying to say is like, there's a lot of improvisation, like the cities and the agencies have had to impro improvise, there's the creation of new institutions, um, and the question for, for the future, or the lessons that we can have from here is like, well, like cities, like Noel Foysen from the Office of Emergency Management said, all the cities in, in, in the states are gonna have to start seeing and this as, um, how to react to disasters that are not happening in their cities. And we're gonna have to be prepared for that. And Julia Menzo, which is the, the director of um, the long-term recovery group was also saying that same thing. And I'll leave you with this last, last quote. We're facing um, a situation where people coming from outside of the area um, where the disaster did not happen. And, and we are doing our very best as a disaster responding community and the Hispanic community together and the, and the government entities to try to find ways to support these families in terms of helping them make good decisions for themselves. But at the same time, we're working with a finite number of resources that already were here. Um, so it's a situation like I think the country is going to have to look at, you know, how do we, how do we assist people who are new to our area and um, coming as evacuees? And it's, it's really challenging, but it's something that is kind of being thrust upon us and we are being as creative as possible to solve these problems. Right. So this is going to happen more and more often. This is like we are in a situation where this is people who are just displaced. They're not even like refugees. There are people from this country. How are cities are going to be prepared to this, to respond without funds coming from outside, without organizations created specifically for this response? So the lessons that they're saying is like, let's, all cities are going to have to start looking at this. Like, how, what are we going to do? Thank you, Catalina. And we're going to take just a few questions for five minutes. One question. <laughs> Alex is like, no, one question. <laughs> so it better be a really good question. <laughs> if anyone would like to ask a question, they can come up. And if I know, if not, <laughs> well, yeah, I'll. So yeah, maybe the panelists can um, talk a little bit about the political impact of the migration in, uh, occurring from Puerto Rico. Um, briefly, um, I had, was going to project on both Puerto Rico, uh, the impact in Puerto Rico, and the impact in the United States. I'll focus very briefly in the United States. Um, uh, this is the, um, if you look at the columns on the right side, these are the, turn, um, the proportions of the Puerto Rican population um, 
that turned out to that reported voting or that were 18 years of age and older. So CVAP, citizen voting age population. Uh, if you are 18 years of age, that is the proportion. Uh, I'm going to focus on this column here. Why? This is 2014. This is an off-year election, which is what we're going to be facing a few months from now. Uh, what we see here is that, uh, oops, I just lost the, here we go. I lost the, the cursor. In any event, um, do you have the clicker? Seventy percent of the population were eighteen years of age and older and lived in they lived uh, in the residence for less than a year. They represent only about eleven percent of the people who turn out to vote. Uh, the vast majority of people that turned out to vote in 2014 were people who lived in their homes for five years or more. So even though we're going to be having over 100,000 people uh, coming to the United States from Puerto Rico over the past you know, few months, those people are not going to be as likely to turn out to vote as people who are long-term residents of the United States. Moreover, we have learned that, uh, you can see up here at the very top, most of the Puerto Ricans who turn out to vote are Puerto Ricans born here in the United States. So there will be Puerto Ricans that are going to be turning out to vote uh, in that um, you know, midterm elections in two, you know, November 2018, but it's not going to be as much as people who have been longer term residents than you know, newcomers to, uh, to, the, to the political system, number one. Number two, they also need to be mobilized. And the political parties in uh, the United States are not likely to mobilize voters that are not prime voters. The motivation to turn out to vote often, oftentimes is individual, and that correlates with higher income, education, language, etc. And Puerto Rican newcomers are not those types of voters, unless there are indigenous local institutions that will mobilize Puerto Ricans, and that, that is certainly happening in Florida. And Florida, we know, is going to be a very competitive state. So we see that there will be some implications uh, for politics, uh, for Puerto Ricans coming from Puerto Rico. But I think that is, what is going to be happening is that there's going to be a lot of mobilization from people who are long-term residents of the United States that are incensed about the, you know, what uh, Catalina, uh, Catalina, yeah, Catalina just mentioned, the inattention and the lack of preparedness and the, 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 the fact that people are just winging it oftentimes, to respond to this crisis. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists for sharing uh, their deep knowledge and passion and commitment to Puerto Rico and continuing to talk about this um, for many years to come and raising awareness to, for the importance of these issues. So thank you very much, each of you. Thank you.